Oopsie. Okay. There we go. Is it going to do the thing? Yes, it did the thing. Oh, no, it didn't do the thing. Yay! It's actually working. Remember, it was being a little finicky last time, but it's behaving just fine tonight. Hooray. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Tuesday in which I'm playing Socrates Jones, Pro Philosopher, the re-release of, um, of a Flash game. I think it was a Flash game. Um, yeah. So I think... I, I, I'm guessing, I don't, I, I don't exactly know how long we, this game is, but I'm guessing we're probably most of the way through it by this point. We're, we're, uh, we got through the first four chapters last time, and uh, I don't know how many more chapters there are, but probably not that many. Um, so I'm expecting to finish this game tonight, and then after we're done with this game, uh, I will move on to... Um, Bioshock. Oops, I forgot to pop out my chat. A chat would be good. That would be good to be able to see the chat, you know? Okay. Alright, so let's continue where we left off. Where we just finished um, debating John Stuart Mill and uh, Ari, my daughter, was pretty steamed about it. Because she loves him for some reason. <laughs> Socrates? Yes, Arbiter? I have been pondering your request that I bring forth my best. It seems to me attempting to assign a quality hierarchy to the philosophers in this realm would be demeaning. I have thus determined that when you requested my best, you meant my most challenging. Hey, Michael Fort! Welcome. Wait, what? So on that note, allow me to present to you Immanuel Kant. His thoughts are indeed quite challenging. Immanuel Kant was a real percent who was very rarely stated. No. <laughs> I will not break into the Monty Python Philosopher's Song. I will not break into the Monty Python Philosopher's Song. I've been wanting to do that since I started playing this game, but I will not. I will resist the urge. Guten Tag, Socrates Jones. Oh, God. Good luck with this one. I could only ever get, to get through the first couple pages of his work. I hope you enjoyed your stay in philosophical kindergarten. For the conflicting methods you have employed to confuse other philosophers will not work here. Oh, God, it's von Karma. <laughs> Why not? No reason. I simply needed to fulfill the prerequisite grandstanding. Grandstanding. Check. Uh, okay then. Kant, if you would please explain your philosophy as clearly as possible. <laughs> oh boy, what am I in for? Of course, Arbiter. First, I must counter the unreasoned thoughts of other philosophers. Any truly moral philosophy must, first and foremost, protect human dignity. As consequentialist thought natu naturally violates our pride as men, we must work from an intentionalist grounding. Excuse me? <laughs> I'm already confused. Give me a moment, Herr Jones, and I shall explain. There are many things which men covet as good. However, a focus on consequences reduces men to mere means, undermining human dignity. In reality, the only thing that is good without qualification is goodwill. Thus, we are moral if our will is defined by the intention of doing the moral thing. Uh, that's already flawed. <laughs> Intent is not magic. And there we go. 
As you can see, I'm approaching this from a different angle than the, than the neophytes you debated before. Intentionalism added to the idea slate. I see. So wait, the consequences of actions don't matter at all? At the very least, they are irrelevant to moral worth. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Goodwill is not inherently good. You can have you can have the best of intentions. You can you can think you can think good all you want, all you like, but it's not worth a whole lot if you don't do anything. I'm gonna fight Kant with a knife. I approve of this course of action. <laughs> According to Kant, all true moral systems must be intention-based. I mean, like, it's a good start. Like, intention will get you somewhere, but it won't get you everywhere. <laughs> of course, ideally, one's actions would also have positive consequences, but it is positive intentions that are essential to be of moral character. Socrates, are you ready to continue? All right, here goes. So far, this doesn't seem too bad. Yes, Arbiter. Yeah, let us begin then. I could do a much more comical German accent, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> there are many things which men covet as good. What do you mean by this? I believe this is simply stated. Our disorganized society holds many things in high esteem. Okay. Can you back this up? Over your time here, you have encountered individuals who believe good to be found in all sorts of things. Security, happiness, piety. I believe this diversity is enough to support my premise. Okay. How is this related to your conclusion? I am acknowledging the diversity and breadth of moral theory. It seems only fitting to recognize the scope of the field we enter, does it not? Okay. Fair enough. However, a focus on consequences reduces men to mere means, undermining human dignity. Can you clarify this for me? I mean that getting caught up in various ends, whether they be happiness, a social contract, or piety, causes one to lose sight of what is most important. They turn our beings into mere tools for an arbitrary goal. Cogs in a careless and soulless machine. Hmm. What do you have to support this statement? I believe you have actually discovered this yourself, Socrates Jones. Take, for example, John Stuart Mill and his philosophy of ut utilitarianism. By arbitrarily assigning the status of the ultimate end to happiness, the, philo the philosophy completely ignores human rights and dignity. And Hobbes' idea that good rests in security, any rational person would question how much we must sacrifice to enforce such an ideal. No, all of these philosophies are looking in the wrong places. They are claiming the contingent and ephemeral as eternal without any, just, without any justification. Mankind must not be reduced to the means of some other goal. Any philosophy that does so has become mired in consequentialism. Eh, uh, right. <laughs> How is this related to your conclusion? It deals with many of the ideas of previous philosophers in one swoop, showing their philosophies to be full of irrationalities. Just think, if your thoughts were as organized as I, you, you could have gotten here much sooner. In reality, the only thing that is good without qualification is goodwill. Goodwill is always good. There is no situation in which harboring goodwill could be immoral. I mean, yes, but it's not enough, really. As a man cannot possibly know the consequences of his actions, it is only fit to judge the will upon which he acts. Well, you can make an educated guess, usually. <laughs> Admittedly, there are some cases where, you know, things you couldn't possibly have predicted will happen, but... Pattern recognition is a thing. When this will is good, there can be no doubt that regardless of effect, his actions were moral in nature. Assessing the will is the only way to keep man as an end and maintain his dignity. So, what you're saying is, when I tell Ari she can't play games all night because I'm concerned for her, my action is noble regardless of her response? This is correct. Dad...
This is my conclusion, Herr Jones. Most of the goods laid out are invalid. Only this one stands in all situations. Thus, we are moral if our will is defined by the intention of doing the moral thing. As long as we intend to act morally, then we ourselves are moral. This seems pretty straightforward, does it not, Herr Jones? But, uh, how do we know whether the intended course of action is moral? By whether or not it adheres to the categorical imperatives, of course. Oh, of course. The what now? <laughs> no, wait, hold on. Uh, what? Kant, these things you just mentioned... Categorical imperatives? Yes, uh... What are they, exactly? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, no, they're looking in the wrong places. I'm going to look in a completely different wrong place. <laughs> Indeed, I don't believe you ever explained those. My apologies. Categorical imperatives are the moral laws we should seek to discover. My apologies. <laughs> Listen closely, I shall explain. If we intend to always do the moral thing, we must develop rules or maxims to shape our actions. There are certain actions which we must always avoid. Other actions we should take at every opportunity. These ideas form rules we must follow at all times, regardless of emotion or consequence. Hmm. These rules are categorical imperatives. Okay... The confusion people feel about this man's ideas makes sense now. Where should I begin? <laughs> um, Kant? <laughs> <laughs> ah! Apologies, Herr Jones. I was momentarily distracted by your beard. It is unsightly. How can one stand have such a blemish upon one's face? Hey, the goatee is one of the few cool things about my dad. Oh, thanks, Ari. <laughs> Personally, I always like the sweater vest. <laughs> well, regardless of how you all feel about my beard or my sweater vest, I have questions for you, Kant. Of course, ask away. I have questions about your cravat. <laughs> okay, if we intend to always do the moral thing, we must develop rules or maxims to shape our actions. What do you mean by this? The morality of an action stems from the rules which govern it. In order to properly assess our intentions, we must therefore clearly define these rules. This is very much a continuation of my last argument. Our intentions must be defined somehow, with rules that shape what we should, what we should and should not do. But without the guidance of rules, we will be truly lost. It establishes the link between my previous ideas and the ones I am about to espouse, the marble foundation upon which my tower of reason will be built. There are certain actions which we must always avoid. There are certain things that are clearly always wrong when the maxim behind them is examined. This is sounding... I mean, this sounds kind of a lot like Mill's uh, philosophy, actually. <laughs> this seems like a grand statement. Do you have an example? Lying is an example. To lie is to spread deceit among men. By a lie, a man annihilates his dignity as a man. Thus, one should never lie. Ever. Hmm. Okay. Never lie. Kant believes that lying is one of the actions which is categorically immoral. Well, that's extremely debatable. <laughs> How is this related to everything? I am describing the first sort of imperative, the negative sort. Other actions we should take at every opportunity. Certain actions are clearly always good, should be followed. Give me an example. Helping a dying man. By attempting to render such assistance, one respects human dignity. Thus, one should always make the attempt. Ha! See, Dad? Kant also thinks I did the right thing. I thought you weren't much of a Kant fan. Hush. Validation is always nice, even if it comes in a confusing package. Okay. Help the dying man. Kant believes the act of helping a dying man is among the imperatives. I'm 
describing another type of imperative, the positive sort. These ideas form rules we must, we must follow at all times, regardless of emotion or consequence. The maxims which we can deem to be imperative is must, must be treated as if they are laws of nature. Even if, in a specific situation, the outcome may seem personally painful, we have no choice but to follow them. One cannot simply choose to ignore gravity. I can. <laughs> Arbiter, you're not helping. <laughs> My metaphor still works. <clears throat> Why such a strict line? When we deem some maxim to be moral, we must follow it. For if we do not, then the power of the idea is undermined, and no good can come from it. Huh. It details the extent to which imperatives should affect our lives. Thus, the extent of the applicability of the idea. These rules are categorical imperatives. What does this mean exactly? Simple. They are categorical, meaning they apply to everyone without exception. They are also imperative, meaning they tell us how to behave. Kant was always making up terms, Dad. That's part of what made him such a lovely read. <laughs> Being a term I coined and assigned, I don't think that is necessary. I choose the terms, which is the right one. <laughs> Fair, I guess. Well, in reality, it provides a name for what I have described here. Okay. Hmm. Any ideas, Ari? Nope. None whatsoever. I told you, I don't understand a word this man says. Wonderful. Well, back to the top. You, you can't call me out on using the wrong words if I just keep making them up for all my arguments. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's something to be said for defining the, uh, the terms of engagement, so to speak. Uh, okay. Well, I think this is the one I have to challenge. Regardless of emotion or consequence. Hmm. Not totally sure what this is going to do for me, but let's save and try things. I'm not convinced we should always follow this rule. There may be cases when helping a dying man will be wrong. Like what? Well, like, what if the dying man was the Joker? The who? <laughs> Dad, is this really your counterexample? Um, yeah. But Batman would never let the Joker die. Even he, even he would think you should help in that case. Indeed, Batman would be ashamed of you for suggesting otherwise. <laughs> okay, okay, I retract my counterpoint. <laughs> okay. There we go. Hold on just a moment. Kant, you, cl you claim we should never lie, correct? That telling the truth is a categorical imperative? Indeed, it is the prime example of one. Right, and you also claim that we must follow the imperatives without fail, correct? Correct, Herr Jones. Well, that's interesting, because using only those two facts, we're, all we're already in a worrisome place. Oh? I will admit that in most situations, lying is not the most moral of choices. But there's no denying there are some situations when the truth can be deadly. Situations where lying would be the better thing to do. Ah! Let's say one was sheltering fugitive, fugitives from an oppressive regime, keeping them hidden from the forces which would persecute them. Ooh. That's a good example. It seems to me that keeping them hidden is clearly the right choice, but you would want us to blab to every person who shows up at the door. This strikes me as empirically wrong. Oh, interesting. Way to go, Dad. 
Nicht schon wieder, bitte. Uh, right. You can swear in German all you want, but I have a point. <laughs> Earlier, you stated, any you stated anything that needs qualification can't be the origin of morality. But your prime example of an imperative just demanded qualification. Well, what do you have to say to that, Kant? Doesn't the intention to protect, to, pro bleh, to protect people also have value? Even from your perspective, your law seems far from universal. Nine cents. Nine cents? <laughs> Excuse me, I have to take my morning walk. Hey, you can't just walk away from this debate. Get back here. You just walked off? He does that sometimes. Do not worry. Oh, you're back. Indeed, my morning walk is completed. Morning walk, check. <laughs> is there even morning in the intelligible realm? No, there isn't. It's, it is unacceptable. But regardless, back on task. Socrates Jones, the counterpoint you gave earlier was false. That one, should not, that one should not lie still stands as universal. Despite your objections, there is no doubt that to lie in that situation would be immoral. Categorical imperatives stand as absolute, without qualification. But, but... He's seriously standing by his position? Is he even allowed to do that? Remember, Herr Jones, consequences are irrelevant. It is only our intention that matters. Oh, okay. Fine. <laughs> To become too invested in, 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 in an individual scenario is to undermine the sanctity of thought. Once a maxim fulfills the universality test, it can be accepted as a categorical imperative. The what now? <laughs> At that point, we are obliged to obey it. Always. The universality test? Yeah, the method through which we discover and verify categorical imperatives. Allow me to elaborate. Please do. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that was kind of what I was thinking too. Like, he's like, yeah, you know what? No, I'm still right. <laughs> but what if I'm right? But what if, too bad? <laughs> in order to verify the morality of an idea, one must subject it to the universality test. Imagine a world in which everyone follows the maxim behind your action. If a contradiction or irrationality arises, the maxim cannot be moral. And there we go. Explain the, un the universality test. Check. Okay, hold on a moment. What the heck are these things you keep checking off? I have created an agenda. All the tasks which I need to accomplish are presented upon it in sufficient detail. The events of this debate are on your agenda? How's that even possible? Careful planning. Wisdom, Socrates Jones, is organized life. And an organized person will be asking me questions right about now. Uh, right. This is getting harder and harder to deal with. I can't present something I don't understand, but I'm not sure how much longer I can go. I've got to find something, and quick. Yes. More philosophical skullduggery. In order to verify the morality of an idea, one must subject it to the universality test. <laughs> My counterpoint is nah, and furthermore, <laughs> and also your face is ugly, <laughs> and your mom, <laughs> you fight like a cow. <laughs> we must verify that your maxim stands as valid in all situations. We have established our principles must be unquestionably moral, yes? Well, in order to ensure such is the case, we, we must create a situation where every potential question would have to be asked. Thus, the universality test is required. Every potential question. Okay. This illustrates the nature of the test. Yes, <laughs> without your mom joke. I mean, it's right here in the uh, in the idea slate. <laughs> Your face is ugly. <laughs> I have yet to use it. <laughs> I will be really happy if, like, that is actually the correct answer to one of these <laughs> one of these statements. It probably isn't going to be, but it'd be great if it was. 
Imagine a world in which everyone follows the maxim behind your action. Essentially, in every situation where someone is faced with a choice where they could follow your maxim or not, they would follow it. That is the world you will be imagining. Well, it's an instruction. If you don't understand it, I could explain it better. <laughs> Imagine all the sheeple. <laughs> it's an essential step of the universality test. If a contradiction or irrationality arises, the maxim cannot be moral. Could you explain this further? Of course. A contradiction is a situation in which your maxim defeats itself. Okay. This is one way an idea can fail the universality test. An irrationality is when your maxim would create a world that is worse for wear. That is the other way the universality test can be failed. Huh. Interesting. This guy feels like we're arguing with the Final Fantasy Tactics tutorial guy. Oh my god. <laughs> it kind of does. And that guy was, like, specifically called out as being extremely long-winded and boring. <laughs> if there is a contradiction, then your idea creates problems with itself. Therefore, it cannot be moral. If it is irrational, then you clearly shouldn't want it in the first place. These are pretty good reasons for these to be grounds to fail the test, are they not? It details how a maxim can fail the universality test. It would not be much of a test if you could not fail. I don't know. I wouldn't mind taking a test like that. Yes, we are. That's, that's what we're going over. Yeah, the categorical imperatives. Contradictions are maxims which are inconsistent with themselves. Excuse me? If an idea, after being applied to everyone, creates situations where people may be willed to behave in opposing ways, then your idea is contradictory. As a result, it probably should not be considered. So just like, like yeah, like literally everyone in the world would do this thing. <sighs> yeah, hmm. Of course, I should provide a case study. Let us imagine a world where it was accepted that one should lie for their own gain. As the advantages of lying come entirely from deceiving those who tell the truth, in a world where everyone lies, there are no advantages at all. In this way, lying for one's gain contains a contradiction. It simply does not make sense when applied as a universal law. Man, this guy really hates lying. This is just one example. Any time an idea creates inconsistencies with itself, it cannot work. This elaborates upon the nature of the contradiction failure. Irrationality is create a world which is worse for wear. But that requires consequences, and you said consequences don't matter. <laughs> Sometimes the world would clearly be worse, be worse off if everyone followed a maxim. For example, if everyone stole from one another, our sense of security would deteriorate. It would be irrational to will such a world to be. Thus, stealing is categorically immoral. Huh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Imagine. I think this stands pretty solidly. One cannot will a world which would be worse than this one. Hmm. Ah, oh, that, that, it's the goodwill thing. This elaborates upon the nature of the irrationality failure. Okay, but let's try this. Immanuel Count. What's the one thing which, from the very beginning of our discussion, you emphasized above all else? Intentionalism, of course. What we will is far more important than what we make. Right. That's what I thought. And that's fascinating. Because checking for irrationality sounds a lot like assessing the consequences to me. Wh what? You claim we cannot will a world that is worse than the one we have now. But the fact is, the very act of assessing how the world would be gives weight to consequences. 
You'd think that you would throw this out, but instead you have this as a key step in the universality test. Determining whether your maxim is a categorical imperative is thus a fundamentally consequentialist procedure. I... I... Ah! This is not on my agenda. It is most impractical. I demand you stop at once. <laughs> but surely you see my point. It's quite ironic, don't you think? That the process which creates the rules for your intentionalist ideals relies so heavily on assessing consequences? You talk about internal contradictions being grounds for failure. Well, here's a grand one for you. The universality test would fail itself. Oh, snap! Incredible. It seems to me that either, con that either consequences matter or your method of choosing ideas is incorrect. So which is it, Kant? Which part is wrong? Either way, it seems pretty devastating to your ideas. <laughs> this... your thoughts, so disorganized. Order! I need direction! I need... I need... Nine! <laughs> Have my philosophical constructs thrown into question. Check. You have done an excellent job here. I would be lying if I said you had not given me much to think about. Perhaps another decade of silence is in order. Silence and thought. I'll be the same here, Jones. Is it over? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I guess that's all we're going to get out of Kant. Yeah, yeah, that was kind of what I was getting as well. Like he's kind of like a parallel, parallel John Stuart Mill. <laughs> the end of the road. Well, that was quite a spirited performance, Socrates. Who would have thought an accountant from New York would turn out to be such a great debater? Thank you, Arbiter. I believe Friedrich Nietzsche has volunteered to discuss his ideas with you next. A prominent, if sometimes paradoxical, thinker, he is often quoted by the angsty teens of your era. Give me a moment and I will retrieve him. Of course. <sighs> you okay, Ari? I don't know how you're still doing this, Dad. I mean, look at me. I'm getting, I'm getting tired. I'm just helping out. I know, Ari. I was personally hoping Kant's answer would hold up. At this point, I kind of think the nature of morality is impossible to find. Mm -hmm. What did you say? Oh, uh, I said I kind of think the nature of morality is impossible to find? Huh. Interesting. Uh-oh. Oh, no! <laughs> Unfortunately, while interesting, that description of the nature of morality is also incorrect. <laughs> Wait, what? I'm very sorry, but the rules state he only has one chance, and I'm afraid that was it. What the hell? That's completely bogus! My dad wasn't trying to provide an answer just then, he was just thinking to himself. Tell him, Dad, tell him you didn't intend to make a statement about morality. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yep, indeed. Dad? Ari, he's right. What? What I said was, in fact, a statement about the nature of morality. I can't deny that. I'm glad you are taking this reasonably, Socrates. Again, the deepest of apologies. I hope you will be able to make yourself comfortable here. Wait, Arbiter, before you leave, can I ask you one thing? I suppose. Why? Excuse me? Why am I wrong? Come now, your stance is full of holes, Socrates. Of that much, there is no doubt. So you've said, but why? If I'm going to be here forever, I'd like to at least understand why I'm wrong. Very well, Socrates, that is only fair. Allow me to spell it out for you. Yay, I can debate the Arbiter! I know, right? <laughs> I want to need to fight too. <laughs> You have presented your philosophical views. Your premise is foolish, as morality has a tangible impact. The world is clearly better when individuals strive to be better. 
I see little reason to doubt the existence of some form of morality in our world. And there we go, Socrates. As you see, your answer is flawed to the core. I see. Well, if you don't mind, Arbiter, I'd like to ask you a few questions. What? Dad, do you really intend to challenge the Arbiter? Yes, I do. Well, listen, I don't know if you forgot this, but, uh, he's the Arbiter! So? Huh? Ari, you once told me to never let an argument go unexamined, didn't you? Frankly, we both know I'm clueless about philosophy. For all my bombast, it's only because of your advice that we've lasted as long as we have. I don't think the lesson is moral nihilism. <laughs> I mean, that's what the Arbiter believes, but I don't think he's right. Otherwise, the game wouldn't be letting me debate him. <laughs> hey, Sungadif. But Dad, we've encountered many arguments that looked solid on the surface, but each and every one of them had a flaw. If we don't look closely at this one, how can we know it's not the same? Examine everything. There's too much on the line for us to forget that now, no matter how scary our opponent looks. All right, Dad. I trust you. Well, this is unexpected, Socrates. I confess, you have piqued my interest. I suppose, given all you have done, some questions are warranted. Ask away, but do not feel too hurt when you come up short. You have presented your philosophical views. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> what views were those? Come now, Socrates, do you really need me to outline your own opinions? I just can't help but feel everything would be clear if you did. Or if you did. Very well then, if you insist. You claim that morality does not exist. Pretty much, yes. This is Phoenix Wright philosophy. This is Phoenix Wright, I can't talk. Phoenix Wright philosophy edition. <laughs> Can you clarify this point? I have already done so, Socrates. You have stated your belief that morality does not exist. Hmm. I don't think I said exactly that, but okay. We'll go with it for now. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Morality ex Okay, yes. I see what you're saying. Yeah, morality exists in the Arbiter stance. And I'm apparently deny and I'm apparently denying that, which seems weird, but I let's let's just see where we're going with this. <laughs> yes, moral philosophy 101. Socrates, be reasonable. Did you not say these words yourself? Alright, Arbiter, I admit you have raised a strong objection to the idea that morality does does not exist. Thank you, Socrates. As governor of this realm, it would be tragic if I had not. Do you see now why such an answer is insufficient? Of course. There's just one problem. That wasn't my answer. What? What you were arguing against is two steps removed from what I actually said. You've discredited the non-existence of morality, but I claim that the answer to morality might not be findable. Well then, those are essentially the same thing. No, they're not. I think we can all agree morality exists in some form for all the reasons you have described. Even if it were different for each person, as Protagoras argued, there's little doubt we could develop some guidelines for how we should behave. But that doesn't mean what we seek, a perfect definition for morality, exists as well. Morality could very well be more abstract, like faith or happiness. Just because it exists doesn't mean there is an objectively best model. Therefore, I can claim a perfect answer does not exist without throwing morality itself out the window. There we go. An answer demands morality, but morality does not demand an answer. I can't believe it, we may just survive this after all. So as you can see, Arbiter, the argument you've built is a very effective counter, but it's a counter to something I did not claim. I see. I apologize for misunderstanding your initial point, Socrates. I guess it's always important to make sure the person you're debating understands you clearly, huh? So Dad's position makes sense now, right? Does that mean you can accept his answer? I'm afraid not. His position still has a number of critical flaws. Allow me to explain. Socrates, you claim a flawless answer cannot be found. However, I do not see how this can be possible when there are infinite potential answers. Already here, you have seen arguments of many branches and formulations. With possibilities so incomprehensibly vast, surely one must stand as infallible. With this being the case, it is only a matter of time before we find the answer. 
As you can see, Socrates, as long as the possibilities are infinite, the answer is findable. Interesting argument. Based around a mathematical concept, I see. Well, you forgot one thing, Arbiter. I'm an accountant. I deal with faulty numbers all the time. Wow, Dad. I just got shivers. So you already know what the problem here is? Well, no. But I couldn't pass up my one chance to make being an accountant sound cool. <laughs> yes, good. <laughs> Remember when I said I trusted you just five minutes ago? Don't make me rethink that. Hey! Being stuck here forever would be bad enough without having made total fools of ourselves. Socrates, do you intend to actually ask me questions? I understand if you do not. You have placed yourself in an unfortunate position. It may be easier to just admit to your error. As if! Okay, Arbiter, let's rumble. <laughs> Philosophical rumble. Socrates, you claim a flawless answer cannot be found. I believe you did that not five minutes ago, Socrates. Was that not the core of our previous discussion? Socrates, this time I believe it's safe to say this, an ac this is an accurate representation of your thoughts, yes? Yes. Then truly, Socrates, backing it up is your responsibility. No, the burden of proof, why? Erp. It establishes clearly what I'm arguing against. However, I do, not, I do not see how this could be possible when there are infinite potential answers. The number of possible solutions that philosophers may think of is not in any way limited. There are infinite possible ideas and infinite variations on those ideas. So essentially, no matter how many answers we discredit, there will always be another one on the table. <laughs> oh no, the consequences of my actions! <laughs> Just thinking about that makes me tired. No, consequences don't matter! <laughs> Except they do! We've been through this! <laughs> are you listening to this, Kant? There are consequences. <laughs> can you support that statement? There can be little doubt that potential answers are infinite, Socrates. I will provide evidence for this in my next statement. How does this connect? It cleanly sets up my counter-argument. Already here, you have seen arguments of many branches and formulations. Over the course of your time here, you have met philosophers with many different ideas. These ideas were not variations of one another, often they would be entirely different beasts. So there are infinite possible answers because there are infinite possible branches? Each branch of thinking comes from the belief that something is the source of morality, and there are infinite things in the world that could be that source. I say it's the rocks and the trees. <laughs> Screw you, Protagoras. <laughs> <laughs> when we combine or modify these ideas, it is difficult to imagine that we would ever reach an end. True enough. Yeah, I, th I have a vague idea where this is going as well. Not totally sure, but, uh, but let's see. I do not believe much support is needed. Utilitarianism is a very different beast from social contract theory, which is in turn different from the categorical imperatives. Philosophy is a world with many paths of thought, so many paths that many of them hardly seem related. Clearly there is an incredible diversity here. It reinforces the idea that the set of possible answers is, is incredibly diverse, and with such breadth that it seems difficult to claim that the answer could not be one of them. <laughs> Slightly worse than purgatory. <laughs> With possibilities so incomprehensibly vast, surely one must surely one must stand as infallible. I'm not sure I understand. What I'm trying to say here is simple. If we were able to look at every single pattern of thought, there is little doubt the answer would be one of, the answer would be one of them. Back this up for me. What do you mean? Well, what makes you so sure one of them is perfect? Socrates, is the answer not in the infinite itself? Arbiter! Yes, Socrates. The argument you are making here is quite simple on the surface. I can see why, with so many possible answers, you might believe one of them has to be true. Might believe? Correct. 
for while I understand where you're coming from, I'm afraid infinity doesn't quir doesn't work quite the way you think it does. Huh? Uh, I don't understand either, Dad. What do you mean? <sighs> okay, time for a math lesson. To put it plainly, infinite is not the same as all-encompassing. They may sound similar, but the two are actually entirely different. There are infinite real numbers between 0 and 1, but none of them are 2. Oh. Likewise, there may be infinite potential ways to try to define morality, but that does not guarantee one of them is perfect. Well, come now, Socrates. Even if I cannot pro prove the answer is out there, prob probability is surely on my side. Philosophical thought is so diverse, the amount of ground which is covered is truly incredible. With this being the case, surely it seems more likely that, than not that the answer exists, yes? Does it? Over the course of my time here, every philosopher I've encountered has claimed to have the answer to your question. However, close examination revealed that, diverse as they were, all of them had flaws. Come to think of it, that's true. Faced with a parade of great thinkers, all failing to accomplish the same task you've assigned me, my position only seems stronger. There is no evidence that the set of possible answers contains perfection. In fact, it seems extremely unlikely. The fact is, the existence of infinite possibilities does not guarantee a certain possibility is among them. Any claim that it does is simply and objectively false. Now, I guess I can understand the mistake. You are the ruler of the realm of ideas, not the realm of facts, after all. But as an accountant, I could never stand for such an assumption. Nonsense. Socrates, let us set aside the witticisms and return to the basics for a moment. You have posited here that there may, in fact, be no provable answer to the question of morality. Yes. You claim, in fact, that there is no evidence to support there being such an answer. Right, yeah. <laughs> and that seems to be the argument here, too. Like, if we have an infinite, we do have an infinite set of wrong answers. <laughs> Why are you asking so many questions? My dad just said all these things. Relax, Ari. Yes, Arbiter. And the existence of infinite answers cannot itself be considered proof. I see. Well, Socrates, these are all interesting points, but I believe there is one important detail you have forgotten. The answer has been found before. Oh, shit! You claim there is no answer to be found, but history stands against you. The great thinker Socrates completed the task and was granted his wish. His answer had to be approved for this to occur. Clearly there is an answer, and it is possible to find. So you see, Socrates, the answer to morality is clearly findable. If it were not, the great thinker would not have been able to find it. <laughs> Dad? He... He may have me, actually. I forgot about the first Socrates' exploits. If he found the answer, I... Can't really argue with that. Then... This really is the end. Now you understand why I cannot accept your answer. You agree that continuing this debate this debate will be foolish, yes? I... Is this it? Do I have to concede? Even though we came so far... Ari, I... I'm sorry. Yeah, that's, that's my thinking too. Like, okay, well if it exists, then what is it? <laughs> Arbiter, worry not, old friend. There is still hope yet. Protagoras? Not just Protagoras. Hey! What, what are you all doing here? We have come to back you up, old chap. But, but why? Why? Ingratitude is the essence of vileness. I gain much from our discussion. Now it is time to return the favor. You're in trouble, and the imperative dictates that I assist. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Helping a dying man. Exactly. There's no happiness gained from watching a friend struggle. I could be most useful here, assisting you from the sidelines. Good is happiness. We formed a contract to find the answer, and I must follow it to the end. People work together. Euthyphro! Oh no, Euthyphro was the guy who was, t was saying about that morality was in the rocks and trees. Sorry, I got, I got my philosophers wrong. Not Protagoras, Euthyphro. Uh, and you, Euthyphro? Humph. My child, you are still a blasphemer. Rest assured, the gods will smite you one day. 
But until then, I suppose I could lend you a hand. The Goth already did smite me, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Being men, we are all incredibly flawed. Our only hope lies in helping each other. Mankind is flawed. That's kind of where, where I'm thinking is, this is going, because, like, my my vague thought is, like, oh, well, there has to be per there has to be a perfect answer, but there doesn't because mankind is flawed. <laughs> no one is perfect, so no one can find the perfect answer. I don't know. That's just my, my, my first instinct. That might not be correct. Aw, this is so sweet. Thank you, all of you. All right, Arbiter, I'm not going to give up just yet. <laughs> this, is a this is a deteriorating into madness, Socrates. But very well. I shall entertain you a little longer. What is it? <laughs> you claim there is no answer to be found, but history stands against you. I mean, an event from the past directly counters your claim. I mentioned this to you earlier. Do you not remember? Patience, Socrates. I'm about to elaborate. It details the flaw with your claim and how I shall counter it. The great thinker Socrates completed the task and was granted his wish. Many centuries ago, Socrates came to the current arbiter, claiming he found the answer to morality. This was the last anyone ever saw of him. Socrates' absence from this plane is quite conspicuous. Indeed, we have all missed the great thinker. You saw the stir you created just by sharing his name. I don't need much evidence to show that he was granted an exit. It shows what you are claiming to be impossible is clearly possible, as it, ha as, as it has happened in the past. Well, this is pro-philosopher, not pro-theologian. <laughs> That'll be maybe that'll be in in, in, a, in the sequel. <laughs> oh, from what I understand, the sequel is gonna be a lot of like political philosophy. Oh yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, because you throw us all about the gods. His answer had to be approved for this to occur. It is quite simple. If his answer had not been determined to be correct, none of this could have happened. The story has been told countless times, Socrates. Indeed, it is legend in this realm. Scripture, even. Okay, okay, I get it, jeez. Socrates, the approval is, in fact, the evidence supporting the great th Wait. No. Oh. The approval is, in fact, the evidence supporting that the, that, that the great thinker actually found the answer. After all, it's difficult to believe these things are true, no? Without the judgment of the previous arbiter verifying his answer was indeed correct, I suppose many would have trouble believing it. Huh. Interesting. Indeed. We should take note of this, my friend. The arbiter's approval makes the validity of his answer undoubtable. The, or the original Arbiter's judgment is what lets us know Socrates was correct. It's rather straightforward, really. Socrates, the original Arbiter, was widely respected in this world. Do you really intend to question his judgment? Hmm. Maybe I do. I just spelled this out for you, Socrates. It is the cornerstone on which my Temple of Reason is built. And now he sent me like Euthyphro. Or maybe Kant. Some sick fusion of the two. <laughs> that is disturbing. Clearly there is an answer, and it is possible to find. I mean that there is clearly an answer, and it is possible to find. I'm not sure how I could be more clear than that. Even I thought that was a well-organized thought. <laughs> I believe I just did. As Socrates found the answer, the answer must be findable. Proof doesn't get much more simple than that. This is my conclusion, Socrates Jones. Hmm. Socrates. Yes, Mill? I 
think I see what is wrong here. We'll have to dig back for this one. Way, way back. Well, that's about as vague of a hint as you can possibly give. Hmm. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Arbiter. What now, Socrates? You claim that we can be sure that Socrates found the answer? Correct. And we know this for sure because your predecessor verified its validity. Indeed. That's what I thought. Well then, to demonstrate what's wrong with your argument, I'm going to cite one of my colleagues here. Euthyphro! Yes, my child. Do you remember your statements on the wisdom of man? <laughs> oh god, is it? I hope so. <laughs> Ooh, wait. Ooh, I know. Okay, if I, st if I tell him his face is ugly, will he be forced to, uh, to, to, to counter my claim by removing his mask? <laughs> thus showing that his face is, in fact, gorgeous? course. Human beings are fallible and vain. They make mistakes. Gods, however, are- yes, yes, that's quite enough preaching, thank you. Now, Arbiter, let me make this clear for you. Euthyphro may have been wrong about where morality comes from, but he was right about this. Human beings are far from perfect. We can never forget this. And as flawed beings, the answers we formulate will be similarly flawed. As a result, I find it hard to believe that Socrates really did find the answer. What? The fact is, as imperfect as, as imperfect beings, we must always remember we are flawed. The moment we go far enough to claim that our answer is perfect, we close our minds. Yeah, it is true. I know from experience. I, too, have fallen into this trap. Indeed, even the best of us can succumb. For this reason, we must never assume we have the answer. But Socrates, the First Arbiter, are both human, or human-like entities at the very least. Regardless, how do we know that their judgment, their answer, was not an error? You have admitted to your fair share of mistakes today. There's no reason the previous Arbiter couldn't have made some as well. You can't base the credibility of your entire argument upon an appeal to authority. Very well put, Socrates. Indeed, even I'm convinced you could have been wrong all those years ago. Er, uh, right. Arbiter, if a false conclusion was presented convincingly enough, even your predecessor could have made a mistake thus leading to, this, to, to the discovery of an answer that was actually impossible to find. It's still possible the perfect answer is outside of our reach. So as you can see, you haven't proven anything. Nonsense. Very well, Socrates. You have a point, I confess that. Even with the backing of the... Er, you have a point. I confess that even with the backing of the original Arbiter, I cannot prove that an answer exists. Yes! I knew it! I knew I... However... Before you go and celebrate, I wish to point out you cannot reasonably prove that it does not. With us at such an impasse, it all, it all boils down to a matter of potential consequences. Let us assume, for just a moment, that what you have postulated here is true. Let us say, for a moment, that morality cannot be found. I cannot believe you truly understand the consequences of your suggestion. Let me show you why what you claim cannot possibly be right. Socrates, you have just argued we can never be sure of our answers. If that is the case, then there is no point to what we do here. We might as well all give up and become accountants. There is no way we can accept a theory with such horrible consequences. And that is my position on the matter. How... How could you say such a thing, Arbiter? You have just de devalued everything we do here. There is no happiness to be gained from that. I am merely showing the worrisome implications of Socrates Jones' argument. If you take issue with them, you should take it up with him. But wait, just a, I knew it! I knew you were up to, good, to no good, my child! Trying to lower us all to your level. Make us into accountants. Oh, shut up, Euthyphro. The Arbiter's clearly strawmanning Dad, distorting his argument in order to make it sound weaker. Dad doesn't actually want everyone to become accountants, uh, right? Of course not. Oh, good. Thank the gods. Arbiter. He must be getting desperate to resort to such tricks. <laughs> yeah, and fuck you. <laughs> In agreed. <laughs> but yeah, flipping the table. 
kicking over the, the chessboard. <laughs> Even if what you said here were true, the fact that a conclusion is uncomfortable does not mean it should be ignored. <laughs> Makes a series of extremely obvious logical fallacies. Well, I mean, he's not perfect. It does, however, mean we should be wary of accepting it. I must confess, old chat, I would find it hard to believe anything that created such an outcome. As would I. It would be foolish to jump into water so brimming with sharks. Well then, I suppose I will just have to show that there are no sharks, won't I? That the consequences of my argument are not nearly so disastrous. Very well, Socrates. But first, let me issue an ultimatum. This is your last chance. My last what? You gave your answer. The game is already over. It is only through my mercy that it continues. And your damaging claims are beginning to wear my mercy thin. If you cannot show why this conclusion isn't disastrous, I will refuse to accept it, as you once refused Hobbes. I, fi I find it impossible to believe that the answer will be one that made the search itself meaningless. So again, this is your last chance. Alright, Arbiter. One last chance is all I need. I'll show you once and for all why my viewpoint can stand. Hmm. Ooh. Bits. Thank you for the bits. I was confused because I clicked the uh, I clicked the, the the settings button and then and it it made the budding sound and I was like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> Thank you for the bits, 32 bit kid. Socrates, you have this argument we can never be sure of our answers. You just said we should never assume we should have found a we have found yeah. You just said we should never assume we have found a perfect solution. Is that not correct? No, no, I guess it is. What did he just ask? Mr. Jones just asked his opponent to back up his own conclusions. Ugh, again? Afraid so. Hey, guys, remember that one time when I pressed my own statement for backing and it was the right thing to do? Cut me some slack. <laughs> I'm repeating your argument before I show its implications. If that is the case, then there is no point to what we do here. I mean that we, as philosophers, serve no purpose if your ridiculous conclusion is allowed to stand. I believe that thought is that thought is pretty clear. Clear enough for me to wonder if you are wasting my time. Yes, please do. The logic that supports this idea is fairly intuitive, but I shall spell it out. If your conclusion stands, then our efforts to define morality have always been reaching for an impossible goal. Reaching for something that is forever out of our grasp. Yes, but there's not I'm not saying that there's no value in doing that. <laughs> It is about the journey, not the destination. And if that goal is impossible, all our effort towards it is clearly a waste. If your roads don't lead anywhere, what is the point of building them? With these two points laid bare, there can be little doubt that our efforts are useless. Hmm. With that said, though, I don't think we should forget these points. I'd like to look at them a little more closely. See... It, th those are points that he's making, not points that I'm making. He's putting words in my mouth. It details the central problem your reasoning creates. We are striving in vain towards something which cannot be accomplished. As philosophers, it is our duty to seek the answers to questions such as the nature of morality. But if your conclusion was accepted as true, no matter how hard we work, those questions will never be answered. It is supported by your stated outlook. You claim it is impossible to obtain a solution, or to be certain of it at the very least. If this is the case, all efforts to do so are misguided. If your last conclusion was true, then this is the situation in which all philosophers have found themselves. Establishing it helps detail our futility. And if we cannot achieve our goal, there is no reason to try. I don't understand. Can you elaborate? Socrates, the duty of every moral philosopher is to create a perfect definition of morality. No, it isn't. This is what we all work so hard for. And if we can't find a perfect answer, our efforts are in vain. Perfection is the enemy of progress. 
You don't have to be perfect, you just have to get somewhere. That's the point of all of this. Getting somewhere. <laughs> I believe all of this has been made clear before. But not as clear as it was made now. Our efforts are, are, worth no are worth nothing unless we were able to obtain perfection. What do you mean by this? Simply that if we cannot find the absolute answer, then nothing we find will ever stand up to a thorough examination. All flawed assumptions will eventually be discarded. We, we might as well recognize their worthlessness now. Must I really? It strikes me as fairly obvious. A perfect answer is the only answer worth pursuing. Perfection is indeed desirable, but... Yeah, it is elusive. Hmm. It spells out the goal of philosophers clearly in order to show how your conclusion directly harms it. I think this is a job for John Stuart Mill. <laughs> Maybe. We might as well all give up and become accountants. What the heck are you implying? I see no reason to get upset, Socrates. I merely mean that if we cannot succeed as philosophers, we might as well do something else. Right. Can you back up this ridiculous and insulting statement? I have established that it does not make sense for us to pursue something other than perfection. Therefore, if we cannot achieve our goal, we might as well give up and assume a lower profession, of which accounting is one example. <laughs> not even the Arbiter can resist making a dig at my profession. Is it really such an easy target? Shush, Arbiter. How is this nonsense possibly related to your conclusion? It defines what role we would, all, we, we would all have to take in this brand new world you imagined. How frightful. Ah, no! Stop it, all of you! Arbiter, this adds nothing substantial to your argument, and you know it. Very well, Socrates. I suppose I may have gotten carried away. Thank you! <laughs> Get that out of here! <laughs> there is no way we can, accept, we can accept a theory with such horrible consequences. What do you mean by this? I mean that I cannot accept your argument given the consequences. Accepting your conclusion would have drastic negative consequences to our world here, as I have outlined. I believe this is more than enough reason to reject your conclusion. But, but technically you could accept it, right? Yes, I suppose I could, technically. The best kind of <laughs> correct. Then accept it. No, just because I could doesn't mean I should. We are looking for the nature of morality, and your answer is immoral in itself. Alright. I am clearly defining why what I have laid out here is a reason to reject your conclusion. Hmm. Arbiter, I think I finally figured out what's wrong with your entire position. Have you now? Remember, you will not get another chance. I know, and I don't need one. This, Arbiter, is the end. Very well, Socrates. Tell me then, what is wrong with my position? It's quite simple, really. A classic fallacy. You were assuming a solution must be perfect to have value, but that is not the case. In fact, such an assumption strikes me as fundamentally wrong. I just realized that over half of us have facial hair. I'm not sure how to cope with my distress. <laughs> right. Anyway, perfection is, as a general rule, an attractive prospect in every field. But things do not have to be perfect to add value to the world. But let's look at art. Even works as great as the Statue of David or the Mona Lisa are not without their flaws. But despite their flaws, can there be any doubt the world is a brighter place because such works exist? Oh, then it's as Mill would say. They are still good because they increase happiness. Exactly. Whether or not Mill's ideas dominate, increasing overall happiness is certainly one way an imperfect work can contribute. But under your, under your logic, none of these works would have meaning. That's the real disastrous conclusion here. 
but there's no happiness to be gained from that. Hmph. <laughs> Look at the people around you, Arbiter. All these philosophers came forward with their own visions of morality. Ultimately, their views all turn out to be flawed, but does that make their ideas worthless? Of course not! Their theories have had a profound positive impact on the world. Anyone in my high school philosophy class could tell you as much. Flaws and all, their attempted moral systems stand stronger than those created without thought, and the importance of this is palpable. Just because perfection might be unattainable does not mean we should not try. It only means we cannot expect to succeed. This, this is quite impressive, old friend. Indeed, you may truly have a tear, Jones. True, it is our duty to keep questioning, always and forever. For while we can never assume our ideas are perfect, if we don't keep searching, we, may, we will miss the chance to find something better. The fact we can never be sure does not mean we should not hypothesize. The goal may be unattainable, but all the progress made towards it is still a fundamental good. In a way, searching for morality is in fact the most moral thing you can do. What do you have to say to that, Arbiter? Yeah, Arbiter. I say... I say... I say... I say... <laughs> <laughs> um, Arbiter? Oh, wonderful, you broke the Sovereign. Now we'll have to get a new one. <laughs> no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. It's just funny. Funny? Yes, funny. I realize now I have become arrogant in my time ruling this plane. I simply assumed the perfect answer was out there, waiting to be found. Despite the fact that I have found one of my, I have found myself, despite the fact that the one I had found myself so many years ago was wrong, and to think it would be you who put the pieces together, it's humorous, really. What are you talking about? He is not wise because of what he knows, but because he knows what he does not know. People used to say this about me all the time. Now I believe it better applies to you. Wait, hold on, you? Yes. That's right, Protagoras. I am, or was, the great thinker Socrates. What? Called it. <laughs> you what? Yeah, I figured it out like an hour ago. An unverifiable claim, but there is no denying this one is sharp enough. Regardless, finding the answer was my greatest accomplishment. I convinced the old Arbiter I thought I'd found the solution. I even briefly convinced myself. And as a result, I won the challenge. The Arbiter gave me his mantle and told me I was to take his place as ruler of this realm. I took it and became what you see now. But you said Socrates left, and you didn't immediately recognize me as not you. My friend, why would you go so far as to hide your identity? I gave up who I was to oversee this realm. As Socrates, I may have been respected, but I also made my fair share of enemies. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. I felt that, having found the answer, it was only appropriate to distance myself from all of that, to better guide others towards the truth. Of course, once I realized my solution was in fact incorrect, I became determined to goad someone else into finding it. Never once thinking that perhaps it could be unreachable. In a way, the old Socrates did leave that day, but now I think you've brought him back. Well then, Socrates Jones. I think it's time I finally granted you your wish. You mean... Yes. It's time for you to head on home. The both of you. I... I can't believe it! We did it! We actually did it! But... Wait, hold on. Does this mean you accept my answer is true? Am I a pro-philosopher? Certainly not. By your very own logic, you know I cannot do that. I do, however, accept your answer as the best I will receive right now. And I cannot ask for better than that. So, this is for real this time? No tricks? He can just walk through? Of course, Ariadne. What do you take me for? Just making sure. Dad, do you know what I'm going to do first when I get home? What? Sleep. Sounds like a plan. <clears throat> well then, Hobbes, Mill, Protagoras, Kant, Euthyphro, Socrates, uh, Prime. <laughs> I guess this is it. Goodbye, Herr Jones. You will be missed. Indeed. It was a pleasure making your acquaintance. I will miss you, Socrates. You were almost as intelligent as the original. Thank you, all of you, for everything you've done. 
An extra big thank you to you, Mill. Seriously, you are just as awesome as I thought you'd be. I'm going to miss you. Now, now, Ariadne Jones, you are going to make this old man blush. Let's not single anyone out, Ari. Everyone here has been great. Except for maybe you, Thufro. <laughs> what? Now wait a minute. <laughs> Come on, Dad. Let's go. Screw you, Euthyphro. Just <laughs> middle fingers all the way back through the portal. <laughs> I've had enough of this weird floating architecture for a good long time. All right, Ari. Lead the way. Farewell, Great Thinker Jones. See you again in a few dozen years. We did it! I think there's a bonus uh, chapter. Which I will look for once we've seen the credits. Billy the Salesman. Wee! <laughs> Hobbs! Blah! <laughs> Yeah, you may see some uh, some familiar names in these credits. Uh, uh, if you've played uh, Elsinore, or if you remember my um, my stream of Elsinore, uh, there's some there's some dev crossovers. Um. And uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how I how I uh, learned about this game because uh, one of the devs of Elsinore contacted me and was like, "Hey, I'm looking for people to play." This game and and um, stream it or like YouTube it. So if you know any, I know I've said this before, but if you know any uh, other streamers or streamers or YouTubers who would be interested in this, uh, then uh, the devs are trying to get people to be aware of it and um, look forward to the sequel. And then Veronica and then Veronica was all actually I think Kant is the best philosopher. Did you tell her he hates beards? Oh, of course. Because I tell everyone about my trip to the afterlife. Hey, for a near death experience it was pretty cool. Your mother found it very interesting. I mean she found it ridiculous and was humoring her concussed ex. Uh, look, I'm pooped. I think I'll take a nap. You sure? There's a council debate on soon. Your favorite? Ha ha, very funny. Have fun with that. It's nice to have things back to normal at last. Socrates Prime. <laughs> Is that you, Ariadne Jones? But what? What? Hmm. I must say, this is a much earlier visit than I anticipated. Ari? To be continued. Uh oh. In Pro Philosopher 2! Um, let's see. Is there a. Here we go. Bonus! <laughs> Socrates Jones, pro philosopher, is a game about debates. It has you face off against famous philosophers of all sorts. It's also got jokes. People really liked the game back in 2013, and the re-release is even better. So you should get a copy from me, right now. This argument isn't actually in the game, by the way. <laughs> Let me get this straight. Billy the Salesman is selling me a game about me? Seems like it. Isn't this all a little too meta? Sometimes meta is good, Dad. Now get back in there. <laughs> what do you mean by this? There are other games with similar mechanics, I hear. 
but this one's built around specific questions that inspire healthy discussion and understanding. Ask for clarification is one. You just used it, partner. The game is an interactive debate. You press some buttons and debate. It's based on the, Socrat on the Socratic method, using people's own ideas to expose contradictions and reasoning. The Socratic method added to the idea slate. Ooh, wait, hold on. Don't use my ideas. That's the Socratic method, baby. The Socratic method. You can use people's own ideas to expose internal contradictions in their reasoning. How is this related to your conclusion? The whole debating thing is the core of the game, partner. Without it, you'd have no choices, and then what sort of game would we be? You don't need choices to be a game. Yeah, I'm not touching that one. <laughs> Most characters in the game are big-time philosophers from history. Perhaps made a little more outlandish. Humbug! <laughs> yep, that Hobbs sure needs a hug. You go first. <laughs> Can you back that up? Who exactly will I be facing? I mean, I could name them all. But I don't want to... But I don't want to. It's fun to discover yourself. It's fun to discover for yourself when you play the game. Most of them are in the screenshots on the Steam page. Shh! <laughs> I guess people like learning things. Maybe. Well, this shows one of the ways you can learn things is with, 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 is with Pro Philosopher. <laughs> it has lines that are funny. This isn't one of them. <laughs> Aw. <laughs> Prove it. What? Make a joke. Uh, I, I, uh... You can't just demand someone make a joke, partner. That puts him on the spot. Sets expectations too high. You're trying to make me fail. Jeez, okay, sorry. I guess... Uh, yeah, sure. I guess we could, we could call this edutainment. Kind of, of, of a, at a higher level than most edutainment games, but yeah. <laughs> Pro Philosopher 2. <laughs> I, I <laughs> and I've had I've had poor unfortunate soul stuck in my head for the past like w like months by now. <laughs> You're not helping, <laughs> but you know I can't complain too much. My extensive market research has people like funny things even more than learning things, so jokes might matter more to you. Who knows? Half a million people played the original, can you believe that? And it had some glowing reviews from JS Games and Rock Paper Shotgun. Seeing this re-release is even more polished, it's a sure winner, partner. <laughs> yes it is. I would apologize, but sorry not sorry. <laughs> hey Samuel Stokes Music! Right as we're talking about having songs stuck in our head, we have a music person. Hello! Welcome. And thank you for the raid. Hello, raiders. What's so good about the game? Folks said it was fun and funny. They also said it had nice art and sick bops. In the new version, everything's rendered at a higher resolution in widescreen. You can appreciate all my products in glorious HD. Ooh, improved art. Those darn devs also added some fine QOL. Achievements, dynamic saving, and controller support. Quality of life. Don't forget that they're doing it all for free. Of course, of course. How could I forget that? Free! Improved art. The game is now rendered at a higher resolution and rebuilt for widescreen. Quality of life. Saving it at any point. It is a pretty good change, as is the log for lines you missed in controller support. Free! Intelligible Games released Socratic Jones Pro Philosopher for free. What value? Yes, the ability to save scum. <laughs> it's important. If the game was bad, you wouldn't want it, right? Showing it's generally considered good seems like relevant information. So you should get a copy from me, right now. Well, you want the game by now, right? Give me some money and I'll get you a copy. How much money? Hmm... 100 seems fair. 100?! I said what I said. 
give you 100 bucks and I'll let you have a copy of this fine product. I should be clear, I don't want 100 male deer. I don't want any deer at all. I want 100 American dollars. You can't really want 100 dollars. Oh yes I do. Right now I have a monopoly on the philosophy debate game market. Who's gonna stop me? How is this related to your conclusion? It is my conclusion. It establishes how much it's worth and that you should get it. <laughs> None of this will be in-game. It's a non-canon demonstra demonstrative thing of a jig. Hmm. What, do you really think the story would have do you really think the story would have a sequence pitching itself? There are limits, you know. And how would I be in the intelligible realm? That makes zero sense in pro-philosopher lore. But, Billy, I'm playing our argument in game right now. What? Yeah, I'm picking options and everything. How was I supposed to know they'd make this an extra? Oh, Billy's moving up in the world. I'm a special feature. Aw. <laughs> I'm sorry, Billy. You won't get a cent from me. What? Do you not want to play Pro Philosopher? Just look at this lovely box. Oh, I do. Desperately. But that's neither here nor there. Because the game is free. Ugh. Maybe Pro Philosopher is worth $100. Hell, maybe it's worth 1000 But the question here is not what the game is worth. It's whether I need to buy it from you. And since the game is free, I can spend that money on something else. Like Elven Ring, or Fortnite Dances. I was thinking more like a nice new hat, but sure. Billy, you made an excellent argument. I should play for a you made an excellent argument I should play I should play pro philosopher. I can't <laughs> Acclaimed educational and funny. It sounds pretty darn neat. But uh, but all that is coming at no cost. I don't have to pay a thing. It doesn't sound like the best business model, but it is pretty sweet. Fine, fine. I guess that's how it's gonna go. I'll find someone else to give me 10,000 cents instead of nonsense. Ha <laughs> ha! Glad that's over. His puns are worse than yours. My puns are punominal. Well, I'm going to go tell everyone about Pro Philosopher and keep an eye out for the sequel. Clearly, everyone should. Hell yeah. I know I will be looking out for it because this game was a blast. And um, I very much enjoyed learning about philosophy because I did not. That was cute, yeah. Um, yeah, I never, I never took philosophy classes in college. I just had like a pretty, very basic like introduction to it in like high school at some point. Um, and uh, yeah, this is cool to see a bunch of other like arguments and uh, and pick them apart <laughs> using the Ace Attorney uh, uh, method. Um, okay, so my plan was, uh, if I had time, I was going to start the next game uh, on my list, which is gonna, which is Bioshock. Um, Bioshock Remastered. But I think, since I only have half an hour, I think I'm going to, I'm going to hold that off until next week. Um, the Good Place of Bridge. I need to see that show. I've not seen any of it, and I need to see it. It looks really good. Yes, check out your local library. Absolutely, there's tons of, of, of material, uh, and you can make your own conclusions, and learn a bunch of stuff, and maybe come to your own, uh, make up your own philosophical ideas about the nature of morality, and then debate them. Preferably not on the internet. Preferably with like people who actually care about your ideas and 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 want you to succeed <laughs> instead of just <laughs> want to waste your time um so yeah i think i'm gonna do make a little a little bit of a short stream tonight and uh we'll do uh we'll do bioshock next week um so i'm looking forward to that because that's a game i've been wanting to play for a long time um and i never got around to getting it on console but now i have it on pc because epic the epic game store had it for free a while back and i was like yes please So yeah, um, this was fun. Keep an eye out for Socrates Jones, Pro Philosopher 2, uh, Governments and Grievances, I believe is the subtitle of that one. 
And thank you for watching, everyone. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow for more Cook, Serve, Delicious 3. 3? What do we have in the realm of raiding tonight? We've got some... I don't know what that is. That is. There we got some more God of War over at Fodic Tulu's channel. Uh, eh. that's cool. Yeah, all right. From from one uh from a bunch of old dead Greek pe dudes to more old dead Greek. Well, not so much old dead Greek dudes. <laughs> Uh, temper my Bioshock expectations. I mean, I'm not expecting like a whole lot, but I don't know. We'll see. It seems it. I. It's. Uh, I'm not. I don't. I. I'm. I'm interested to give it a try. Um, and I have the whole trilogy too. So uh, once I play one, I'll probably play the rest, eventually. Yeah, yeah, and I mean sometimes that's enough. I'm okay with with a, with a mediocre game, with good presentation, or you know, even vice versa. It takes a lot to make me hate a game. <laughs> I mean, I can count the number of games I've rage quit on this channel on like one hand, so I can't imagine it'll be much worse than some of the games that I that I suffered through previously. <laughs> but we'll see. Um, I'm going to keep an open mind. So we'll start that next week. And uh, I will send you over to Ephata Cthulhu for some God of War. And that's fine. Mediocre is still, mediocre is still worth playing. I will go in with low expectations and hope to be pleasantly surprised. So yes, thank you for watching. I'll see you tomorrow for Cook, Serve, Delicious 3. Have a good night, everyone. Later. Bye.